Assume we were back in those bad old days, say the uh, beginning of the 1900s, and assume just for the sake of my hypothetical that there was an Iraqi leader named Saddam Hussein. On the front page of these bad old partisan dailies, it would have been completely acceptable in a page one news story to begin, Saddam Hussein is a dangerous, uncontainable menace to America who must be stopped militarily because of his weapons of mass destruction and nuclear program. That would have been completely acceptable front page journalism. Now you could never get away with that today as a lead on page one. It's not objective. It would be, conceived, it would be seen as a sweeping opinion statement. But you could get away with this as your page one lead sentence. Saddam Hussein is a dangerous, uncontainable menace to America who must be militarily stopped because of his weapons of mass destruction and nuclear program, comma, close quote, White House officials said today. And by the magical addition of those five words, you've transformed what has been completely acceptable in, say, 1903 to something that would be completely acceptable in, say, the year 2003. Acceptable because, and it'd be acceptable journalism, acceptable uh, uh, lead today when you add those magic five words. It would have been acceptable objective journalism in the New York Times even if you then went on paragraph after paragraph quoting unnamed White House officials with no countering views or almost no countering views or a 23 paragraph article where your first countering view was in paragraph 23. Indeed, what I'm giving you is not a hypothetical about the year 2003. The New York Times, in fact, ran story after story in that mode. But they had the magical five words White House officials said today. And the rest of the article, intelligence sources say, White House officials believe, on and on and on. These totally inaccurate front page New York Times articles by Judith Miller and Michael Gordon about Iraq's alleged weapons of mass destruction uh, would all pass muster as objective. Uh, and they appeared on the front page of the New York Times having gone through editor after editor. How many people write for the Ithacan or have written for the Ithacan? Now, there's no more edited news page in the world, perhaps, than the front page of the New York Times. And it was considered okay to all of those editors, this kind of reporting. And the reporters, of course, could say, I didn't give my own opinion. You know, I quoted sources. The reality is that, uh, and, and they were, of course, uh, largely unnamed sources. We now know who the sources are. Uh, they were Bush administration officials and Iraqi exiles who were spinning exaggerating, lying to bring about an invasion of Iraq. And one of the main Iraqi sources for Judith Miller later sort of laughed about it. He said, you know, they said, do you have anything to apologize for? I said, why apologize? Yeah, we got it wrong, but at least we have the invasion of Iraq. This was a source, uh, one of the most important sources for the New York Times, Ahmed Chalabi. So objective reporting, my point here is, Objective reporting is often a far cry from accurate or balanced reporting. It's objective reporting is only as accurate or balanced as your sources are. When I was at FAIR, we used to conduct these studies of who the sources were, uh, the experts in allegedly objective um, news reporting, whether it was NPR, we did a study, the Public TV News Hour, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, ABC's Nightline, which was then the premier news show on TV. Some of these studies of television news showed that the uh, U.S. sources are 90% white, 90% male. Uh, government and corporate representatives always dominate the news uh, on uh, big stories. There are think tanks in America and in Washington, D.C. that go from the far left wing over to the far right wing. They go from uh, labor-oriented or advocates from the poor to huge corporate-funded think tanks. Uh, 
everyone who writes in Washington knows there is this broad spectrum of think tanks. But every study you ever do will find that the right-wing think tanks and the corporate think tanks dominate the news coverage. Imbalances that are bad in normal times get worse during times of war or the run-up to war. A month before the Iraq invasion, FAIR did a study of two crucial weeks. One week before, Colin Powell spoke to the United Nations uh, a very belligerent speech claiming to have all this evidence that they, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And one week after this speech. Now if you look anywhere in the world, you'll see in mainstream publications, France, Germany, England, the third world, the developing world, you'll see that no one bought the speech. Headlines were unconvincing. And then the articles would proceed to point out the holes in the speech. In our television news, Fair looked at, in those two weeks, who was able to speak as a source and who wasn't. 393 people on the PBS NewsHour, ABC World News Tonight, CBS Evening News, NBC Nightly News. 393 people spoke about Iraq. Only three of them were anti-invasion. That's a fraction of 1%. Uh, I think I've said to Vadim that I'm always looking for silver mining when I talk about corporate media. The silver lining is that by that fraction of 1% dissenting views, we had a better debate before our country invading, invaded Iraq than they had on Soviet television before that country invaded Afghanistan. That's, that's your silver lining. And remember, at a time where a fraction of 1% are dissenting views on the biggest news uh, shows in the country, uh, the polls were showing that half of the country was opposing a rush to war. But it was a half of the country whose views were not reflected in the biggest news outlets. In the run-up to Iraq at these elite outlets like the New York Times and the big broadcast networks, there was, and I experienced it firsthand, there was this fear of polarizing with the White House. This fear of saying the emperor has no clothes. A fear of saying the Secretary of State's case made no sense. It's internally contradictory. There's no real evidence. If you're a White House correspondent and your reporting includes, for these big outlets, and your reporting includes sources who are toughly uh, critical of the White House or questioning the truthfulness of the White House. The White House can freeze you out and make your job pretty difficult. In television news, the problem is timidity compounded by the need for star power. Uh, I was a senior producer at the Phil Donahue show at MSNBC in this period. I mean, you know, if you saw your rival channels or rival, rival TV news shows had the secretaries of state and the secretaries of defense and you had low, you know, you had underlings, then your bosses would consider your job a failure. And, you know, when I hear the phrase TV news show, I think the operative word is show. It's show business. And that's why star power is so important. Uh, the quickest way not to get access to the stars is to practice journalism. Because if you practice basic journalism that you learned in Journalism 101, you would have to include critics of those stars in your coverage. And if you had a critic, a tough critic, saying, no, the Colin Powell speech was not accurate, and you featured that person and actually let them talk without being outshouted, and then you tried to book Colin Powell the next night, he wouldn't show up because he could go to these other dozens of news outlets that would never feature a critic of Colin Powell. 